Thank you, and I'm glad that some of my family showed up so we could double the audience size. There we go. <clears throat> so thanks, first of all, Arkansas Times and Lindsay for asking me to be a part of this. I'm really excited about it. Um, one other piece that you left out, because it's not on my LinkedIn profile. Um, I worked for a company called Acumen Holdings, which is a large e-commerce company out of Northwest Arkansas that's been extremely su successful since I left and no longer worked there. Um, so that, that kind of, that intro that Lindsay gave about kind of my background and what I've worked in really kind of leads very nicely into why, why Bourbon and Boots is what it is. Bourbon and Boots is a different approach to e-commerce. We're taking a, an approach that really marries high quality lifestyle content with heavily curated items. We're trying to build a real strong lifestyle brand. And what we're looking at are two major changes that are happening in online media and traditional e-commerce. And I just kind of want to start to kind of put that in context a little bit. We all know the story and the, the story arc of newspapers are dying, publications are dying. Well, it's true, they are. Ad pages in most major magazines are flat or down and circulation is down. And in the bottom you can see online revenue is not replacing print revenue. Are you guys familiar with what a CPM is? Is anyone familiar with what a CPM is? Okay, so a CPM for those of you who don't know is a cost per mille, cost per thousand page views. So that's essentially what a publisher will charge for a thousand page views and what an advertiser is willing to pay for a thousand page views. And so you can see that in the print world, advertisers were paying $60 per thousand page views, whereas in the online world, they're only paying seven. So that kind of puts it in context a little bit. And this is a great chart, I really like it. Starting with Q1, 06, the top line is the cumulative quarterly revenue by all publicly traded news organizations. And the bottom red line is the quarterly revenue of Google. And you can see it's just been drastic. It's been cut by more than 60% in the last six years. And Google is slowly growing, growing. And actually now, it's actually higher. They're actually making more in quarterly revenue than all publicly traded news publications. And this is, <clears throat> I don't think the magnitude of this change can be expressed enough because this change has happened in a course of five to six years. I mean, this is a drastic, drastic change in the economy. And this is how a lot of people have, have approached it. Solution one, Arkansas Times, they go to a paywall. New York Times, paywall. They try to protect the content as much as possible. Solution two, uh, people like BuzzFeed, Gothamist, Demand Media, there's multitudes out there that are going more towards page view journalism, right? They're just going for maximizing their page views to get their CPM, CPM up as high as possible. And so while content is also in massive transition, so is traditional e-commerce. I think we're all familiar with the, the uh, phenomenon of showrooming. I mean, we've all done it. We've all gone into Best Buy, checked the price on the store, on the store shelf, and then checked Amazon to see if it's cheaper, and it always is. So we go and buy it on Amazon. And what that causes is basically this, which is a commoditization of name, name brand consumer products. So this is just an example, KitchenAid Mixer. You've got 18 sellers, and this is only half a page of Google search results right here. They're all selling the exact same product, all of them. And they're all selling it for within you know, 20 to $30 of each other. And you can imagine what this sort of competition does. It pushes margins way down. And so those are the two things that we're seeing and what we believe at Bourbon and Boots, the future is blending content and commerce. And we start with two comparables in the marketplace. One is Refinery29. Are you guys familiar with Refinery29? It's a high fashion site and store for women in their 20s and 30s. It's focused primarily in urban areas. Um, but you can see what their average CPM is and then what their revenue run rate is. And they've only been around about three years. Um, Thrillist is basically the antithesis of Re Refinery29. It's a site for dudes. 
there's no real better way to put it. It's kids, guys between the ages of 18 and 30, great bars, great beers to drink, stuff like that. And they just recently purchased an e-commerce company called Jack Threads. And you can see they're looking at, they're oscillating between $1,900 CPM and they're on a $65 million revenue run rate. Um, and then Bourbon and & Boots, and that's us, and we're focusing on the women's lifestyle media segment, uh, primarily females in the southeastern region between the ages of 25 and 40. Um, and right now we're at about $400 CPM and in excess of a million dollars in revenue. And so this is, I don't know if a lot of you guys have seen this before, but this is a traditional demand funnel, a consumer demand funnel. And what you have at the top is demand creation. And what you have at the bottom is demand fulfillment. And you can see, typically demand creation comes from publications. TV is also at the top of the funnel. And at the bottom is where you have people that fulfill that demand. You know, you saw the ad for for the KitchenAid mixers that we were talking about earlier, you would go to Google and then buy it on Amazon, right? So that's where they're fulfilling it. And what's different about us is that we monetize on both sides of the funnel. So traditionally, content companies want you to come, hang out, read, and you know, look at some ads, but they want you to keep coming back and looking at the ads, but they don't really care if you convert, right? And then most traditional commerce companies want you to come and immediately convert. They don't care if you sit around there for two hours looking at everything. And we care if you do both. We want you to come and hang out, but we also want you to come and convert. So we look at ourselves not necessarily as a traditional uh, e-commerce company. We look at ourselves more as a media company um, that we're building different communities around different specific lifestyles. And this is further definition of kind of how we define our market. Uh, like I said, women's lifestyle media. So we're looking at Southern Living. We're looking at Better Homes and Garden. We're looking at Martha Stewart, also the Condé Nast portfolio. Um, and that total market size is roughly 12 to 15 million people nationwide right now. And those people on average spend about $300 annually on home decor and gifts, which roughly three and a half, four billion dollar market. This slide is more for investors. Um, and how we do it. So first we start with differentiated products. Like in that earlier slide you saw, you know, there's a mass commoditization of consumer brands online. If you're gonna try to sell a product that Amazon sells, you're gonna lose. And you're gonna have to lose money selling it in order to actually move that product. And so that's where we really start, and this is where our bread and butter has been from day one, is finding differentiated products that are made by people that don't sell on Amazon, that don't sell you know, at 20 other online retailers, and that typically don't have a SKU, right? We don't want to sell it if it has a SKU, because if it has a SKU, it has mass appeal. And then what we do is we take those products and mix it with lifestyle content. So when we talk about lifestyle content, we're talking about seasonal recipes, we're talking about different types of lookbooks around apparel and things like that. Um, and then also, since we're focused on, you know, kind of the southern female audience, we're also talking about events that are going on in the southeast and different things like that. And we really try to create an immersive experience for those people because we want them to come and read great stories and we if they just want to come and read that's great but that we also at some point would love for them to buy something but if they want to come and buy and not read that's okay too but we think what that does is it creates a better uh, customer experience and creates longer customer uh, life cycle for us and this is just a quick slide on our business model so we create, like I said, we create great content that we focus heavily on shareability. So what we look at on, on content, like one of the key metrics that we look at is how many social shares per page view. And there's another slide later that hits on kind of our average, but that's how we determine what a successful piece of content is. Um, and our average cost per post is about $30. So we've got a mix of journalists we're paying up to $100 per post, and then a lot of people that are blogging for us for free. 
because they're using us as a promotional tool for their own blog. Um, and our content is averaging about $292 CPM. And then on the second piece, again, back to kind of the bread and butter, it's just focusing heavily on differentiated products. We're not gonna sell something that is sold at Walmart. And you can tell, I mean, one of the, one of, one of the real indicators that we're, we're really connecting with our audience is the number of repeat buyers we have. 25% of our buyers are repeat buyers, which for you guys that don't know a lot about e-commerce, 25% is a huge number. Um, and this kind of talks about our, our virtuous circles that we try to create. When we create, you know, when we create the content, we're trying to create a wraparound experience for that customer. And when we focus solely on the customer and what they want, then a lot of good things also start to happen, which is they share it. And once you share it, you get great SEO from that. SEO is search engine optimization, for those of you that don't know. Um, and our average, our average piece of content, whether that's a story or a product, averages over 952 pins on Pinterest. We initially built our audience through some paid Facebook marketing and then through some paid uh, influencer marketing through Pinterest. And we were averaging about a $2 to $2.50 CPA. CPA is a cost per acquisition for an email, email address. Um, and then we remarket to them. Uh, but what we've seen since we launched last year is that direct traffic has been our number one source of traffic, which is great. And direct traffic means someone actually types in bourbonandboots.com. That's how they come to us, which is phenomenal. Um, and then again, just delighting readers with great, with great content, introducing them to great products they didn't know about and great interesting stories that they want to share with their friends. Um, and this is just a little slide on our traction. Um, we sold over 30,000 products all in every state in the United States and I want to say at least 10 countries. Done over a million two in revenue. Um, our email list is over 175,000, 150 plus vendors from all over the country, um, primarily in the southeast, a lot in Little Rock as well. Our best selling product is actually from a lady in Little Rock who makes jewelry and come to find out she lived right around the corner from us and she's been by far our best seller. Um, and then we've, we have over 500 plus products. And just to follow up, I mean, I, you know, I wanted to have as much of a dialogue with you guys as possible, but these are just a couple takeaways. You know, how to win online. I think a lot of people struggle with this and they don't really know how to do it. They think that you can just put up a website and you can win. That's not the case at all. Um, so a big piece is finding the open space in the market to actually look around, see who the market competitors are, i.e. don't compete with Amazon. Um, and the details really, really, really matter. It's easy to gloss over the, you know, the little things that make, that make sense when you're starting an online business, but you have to focus on the little things. That's, that's where you win and lose. Um, and number three is don't be boring. There are there are billions and billions and billions of people that have sites online that are just boring. And they don't get over the give a crap hurdle is what I call it. It's really the test. It's like you have to do something that people care about. Um, but yeah, this is a short kind of overview of what we've done so far and kind of the logic behind what we're doing. Um, but I really wanted to talk to you guys more than anything and try to, you know, a lot of people look at me like, oh, you work at the internet, but you live in Little Rock. That doesn't make sense. So I wanted to give you guys as much opportunity to ask questions as well. Hi, I'm Mattia Fleischner. I'm class nine of the Clinton School. And I was just interested in hearing two things. First, um, how you monitor quality control with your products. And secondly, how you make sure that um, each person who's giving you products isn't selling to Amazon or isn't selling to other vendors. Do you have a policy that you have them sign off on when you sell their products? Right. Um, so the first question is an ever-evolving problem. You know, how do we 
how do we make sure that we're getting the best stuff? And one of the best ways we've really dealt with that is making every vendor who wants to work with us send us samples of their products because we do our own photography anyway. And that's been a real key driver of growth for us. Um, so when we're able to get those products in the door, we actually take pretty fine tooth comb and look at them. Um, and the second piece is it's pretty easy to tell if someone's selling on other marketplaces. Um, we don't mind if people are selling on Etsy. We don't mind if they're selling on Shop Envy and places like that. Um, but you know, if it has a skew, we don't want it. That's basically what it comes down to. The skew. Um, I don't even know what it stands for, but it's basically just a barcode. Stock keeping unit. Yep. Stock keeping unit. So if you have it, so basically, if you have a skew, you have to go and. There's a big process you do. It's a, if, if you have a SKU, it's more than likely then you're going to be a commoditized consumer brand, right? So all P&G products have SKUs. All major apparel brands have SKUs, things like that. Pardon me, Luke. Uh, thanks for the overview, Matt. I think this is really cool. It's been fun to watch uh, Bourbon and Boots grow, and uh, certainly an inspiration in, in the context of this conversation about you know innovation in Arkansas, and that's something that I think spills into the next session as well. Um, but I'd be curious, can you talk a little bit about um, the actual uh, process of, of, of building the site and how difficult it was to, to create an internet startup, uh, you know, out in Silicon Valley, it, it's just blood, blood throat competition for engineering talent. So how did you approach that as, as a founder and, and, you know, what is the landscape like in, in Little Rock specifically and kind of how you, how you deal with that? Yeah. Um, so that's one of the biggest, that's one of the biggest problems with central Arkansas, as you could imagine, or just Arkansas in general, is just a lack of technological talent. Um, so I was really lucky that one of my best friends is actually a developer. So he was able to help me out a lot in the early days of understanding, you know, what is needed, you know, what sort of skill sets are needed, and those sorts of things. Um, but you know, talent has been the biggest issue we've had. It's really just trying to find people that have any sort of experience in doing whether it's you know massive database optimization or you know heavy design I'm lucky actually Dustin's here he's one of our designers creative director and he's one of the few guys that in in central Arkansas that has coastal talent right like he's actually been to the west coast and worked for Microsoft and things like that and we just don't have a real critical mass of those sorts of people so it becomes very difficult so that's on the talent side on the business side it's really it's a it's an interesting environment because they're they're becoming more players that want to get involved at the asset level of an angel investment and actually makes those sorts of those sorts of bets you know the biggest problem we have is that there hasn't been a big victory right so there haven't been a lot of people that have made a lot of money by investing in that sort of asset class um, so that definitely guided our decision making and how we started the business right we wanted to get to revenue as quickly as possible we wanted to make sure that you know we were building something sustainable which is completely the opposite i think most of the time in silicon valley and new york and places like that where you're going for you know you're able to raise half a million a million dollars just on a pitch deck right like you'll never be able to do that in arkansas so those were, you know, those were the two biggest issues that we've had in starting this business in Little Rock. Just went over the, the disadvantages of a startup in Arkansas from an online uh, company. Uh, can you talk about some of the advantages or do you see any of uh, beginning in Arkansas? Um, there are some advantages for other companies, specifically for ours, I mean, it, the cost of living is extremely low, so that makes it a lot easier. Um, but, you know, I think from a logistics standpoint, uh, the company I used to work for, Acumen Holdings, they actually warehouse all the products that they sell. And so from a logistics standpoint, it's actually fantastic because you can do one to two day shipping pretty much anywhere in the country. 
So that's great. Plus, we already have the infrastructure with people like JB Hunt and you know trucking and all that sort of stuff. That's been really good. As far as you know, other positives for consumer startups, which is what we are, there the cost of living is probably the biggest. I mean, things have changed a lot. The first company I started was Cap Search, um, and that was in 2008. And that was, it was basically the Wild West and Little Rock. No one had done it before. You know, I mean, everyone you talk to is like, oh, I don't even really understand what a startup is. Like, you know, how can you make money when you just have a website? Like, you know, you get all these crazy questions. Your family looks at you like you're nuts. Um, so it's definitely changed a lot in the last five, six years. And it's moving in the right direction. And I'm, you know, trying to do everything that I can to build, you know, first off a sustainable company, but then also help that community. Because one of, the only way that I believe that we're gonna be able to build an actual sustainable uh, tech community or startup community, it, it's not gonna look like Silicon Valley. I don't think that's the goal, is to create, you know, oh, we're gonna be Silicon Valley of the South. That's not really the goal. I mean, I think the goal is to create a vibrant, ecosystem where people can build sizable businesses right and so that's really what i want bourbon and boots to be so we can be you know one of the one of the first successes that returns money to investors because that's really what changes the game so if i'm able to give my investors money back they actually made money by investing in me then uh, that changes changes a lot of people's opinions about working on the internet Can you talk about what's next for Bourbon and Boots? I, I imagine, well, I know because you've told me that, that you think this idea is scalable. Can you talk about that? Yeah, um, so we, we talk about this a lot. It's, it's a conversation that we have daily and it's, a, it's, it's an evolving conversation. You know, we look at the opportunities in the market right now and you know, we think there's a lot of opportunity for kind of replicating this model in other verticals, um, hunting and fishing, uh, you know, men's fitness, things like that. Um, but I think right now what we're focused on is getting as deep into this vertical as possible because we still think there's a lot of opportunity left, a lot of opportunity left. I mean, if you think about the companies out there right now that are serving this market, I mean, they're, they're extremely large companies and they've got subscription rates in excess of 5 million people. Um, so, we're not, we're not satisfied until Southern Living is having a really hard time paying their bills. <laughs> this is just kind of a fun question. Um, bourbon and Boots is brilliant and a perfect fit for what you do. Was that, did it just come to you right away or did you play around with different names? Um, um, I love it. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Bourbon and Boots, I honestly don't even remember how I came up with the name. Um, I was reading Garden and Gun a lot, and I liked what they were doing. I was like, okay, so Garden and Gun, Bourbon and Boots. I like alliteration, so that's really where it came from. And, you know, it's, it's funny, actually, looking back on what the name is now and, you know, realizing it didn't have any strong roots for how we came up with it. You know, I think it's interesting when you look at bourbon independently and boots independently about those products and how they're made and where, how they fit in the marketplace. I mean, they're two products that have a vast market share, but yet there's very few big winners in each of those. Like we all know Jack Daniels, we all know Maker's Mark, things like that, but there's still a hundred to 200 other distilleries that are out there making you know a really high quality product so we think that's really interesting and then the same thing goes for boots i mean there's tons of small handmade boot companies out there that are thriving and doing really well plus these i mean what's not more american than bourbon and boots well yeah thanks can you get a little geek here here on my questioning here is so were, have you been and i'm have sort of my Yelp hat on and, and thinking about this is the um, your user acquisition. Were you surprised at 
how much uh, is coming or how little is coming from, from SEO? And do you think about, and, and like, how do you think about Google and sort of its role in like growing or potentially sort of being a challenge for the business? Right. Is social like the new thing? So first thing is like SEO right. and that landscape and you know, any surprises along the way. Second is, is, is you know, mobile, shift to mobile and tablet, um, how that's affecting the business. Like do people read, spend less time consuming content and that you know, somehow hampers or are they on their devices longer or more likely to be on their devices throughout the day and that increases uh, sales. Um, and then I had one more thing, but I'll, I forgot it, so. Um, yeah, for those of you that don't have a lot of context around what Luther just asked, um, SEO is search engine optimization, which is basically building your site in a way that you can be found on Google um, and other search engines. And Yelp specifically is a company that was able to get to massive scale through SEO. And you guys launched in 04, right? So 04 was a, yeah, that was, things were way different in 04. Um, as far as SEO for us, it's been a decent channel, but not for acquisition primarily, because again, we're not, <clears throat> there's not a lot of search demand for non-commoditized goods, right? So, you know, we're not selling KitchenAid products, so we don't have a ton, you know, we don't have 10 million people a month looking for KitchenAid products. We're selling, you know, a handmade, uh, you know, Johnny Cash necklace, right? No one knows they want it until they see it. So the, the strategy is very different, and you're exactly right. I mean, it, SEO has not been good for us on acquiring new customers. It's been okay, but it hasn't been a scalable channel for us. We focus more on the social channels. We're focused more on discovery, and social channels obviously lend themselves much more to discovery. Pinterest has been massive for us um, because of the quality of our photography. So we're able to get great, great distribution, but then also great customer acquisition through Pinterest. Um, and then I forgot your other question. <laughs> oh, mobile. Yeah, mobile's huge. <laughs> we're not taking advantage of it the way we should be right now. Um, but just, I mean, just to put it in context, how quickly it's changing. I mean, the uptake is drastic. You know, where we sit right now, we're doing 10% more mobile revenue now than we were December of last year. I mean, it's drastic, and we haven't wrapped our heads fully around it yet. We're moving that, well, I mean, it's gonna be, it's, it's, it's the way we have to go. I mean, it's, because that's the way the consumer is going. Um, but we just, we haven't fully encapsulated what our idea is gonna be around that. I remember, remember my follow-up. And then could you talk about, and I, I've played on the site some, but I haven't, um, and I think I've gotten into like a shopping cart mode, but I, I actually haven't um, messed around with like the content yet or, or read any articles. Can you talk about the relationship between the content and the commerce? Is, are there like, you know, if I were a vendor, could I come to you with my own writer and say, hey, I wanna, you know, I wanna place an article about how, you know, the, the fall season is upon us and gosh, it's great to have this homemade nutmeg and click here to buy. Right. Uh, and that kind of intermingling of content and, uh, commerce do you have like policies yet or is it still kind of too early to address yeah. that or no I mean, that's um, a I mean that's a great question it, because it's, like, it's something sorry yeah. we, we, we get you know at, you know one sort of uh, challenge of s the success Yelp has had is that's a question we constantly get is right. if I'm an advertiser do I get you know do I get yep. to monkey around with my reviews do I get to suppress right. negative reviews and it's always been no of course not but once you get success it's like a cost of success when you sort of monetize content, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's the biggest question that, that we get from, you know, traditional publishers. They, you know, there's that church and state line, right? Like advertising and editorial, these guys don't talk. Um, we think, especially because we're not covering news, we're not covering breaking news, you know, we want to be as transparent as possible with our users, but at the same time, I don't think a vendor who creates an amazing handmade, um, you know, canoe, right? Like that guy's the best guy to talk about making things out of wood. So I don't think it's necessarily a disservice in certain examples to provide a customer with a great product that they can buy from somebody, but then also read an article written by the same guy that's making X. 
like I think that I think we're allowed to do that a little bit more because we're more in a lifestyle arena. Um, but we want to make sure we're, we're as transparent as possible about that. We want to make sure that the customer knows that that is the person who wrote it. Um, a lot of what we're, <clears throat> what we're starting to do is more vendor profiles around, around our makers, people that make stuff, and we're doing a lot of that writing internally. So we, we haven't specifically had a lot of run-ins with that, but yeah, I mean, it's an issue that we talk about and try to be very transparent with the customer and then transparent in the office, transparent about that. That's very cool. <laughs> um, I was just gonna ask about, um, going back to the SEO question, mm -hmm. when you were thinking about bourbon and boots, did you do a lot of research on like, I like this, how this sounds, <laughs> but did you research Google keywords? Like, obviously there's a lot of search in boots, there's a lot of searches in bourbon, but the two together, how will that work? And are you still, is that still a developing process? Are you creating alternatives to right. that? And then, sorry, real quick. Um, no, what, what is your ideal process for people who come to your site, reading the content first, then you know, looking at the product, or I'm just kind of interested in what your vision is for that? Sorry, I'm just gonna write it down real quick. I'm bad at remembering. So as far as, um, the name and the research that was done, it was little to none. I mean, it was just, it was more of a branding exercise than actually, you know, quantifying what what is currently existing in the market from that standpoint. Um, but we do that for some of our products and we do it not necessarily from the perspective of we want to utilize this as a great channel, like a great inbound channel. Like we want to be on the top five of Google for uh, you know, Johnny Cash necklace, right? Like that's bad, like no one searches for that. Um, but we do look at it as an indicator for like products that we wanna go after, different categories that might be, you know, ramping up. So you're able to see a lot of that data in Google Trends data and those sorts of things. Um, but again, the primary, the primary inbound channel for all of our people is around social and it's because we want them to discover great stuff. And that kind of ties into your next question, which was what do we really, you know, like what's the best use case for our user? Um, and this kind of goes back to the question Luther was asking about, you know, we were kind of, we were in a situation where we were bootstrapped, we didn't have fundraising, we knew we weren't gonna fundraise for a while, so we focused first heavily on commerce. And we wanted to make sure that we could, you know, keep running this business. So we focused heavily on that first, and we didn't really start ramping up the content until Q4 of last year, and then Q1 of this year we tripled it, and then Q3 we tripled it again. And so we're hoping to do that again in Q1 of next year. But it's uh, for for the use case, you know, we want to provide we want to provide great stuff to our customers, and then also you know, give them two to three articles a month that make a lot of sense for their lives. What sort of conversion rates are you seeing on people who read the articles to buying stuff? So people that read the articles are our most valuable customers. They tend to have a lifetime value that's 50% higher than our, than our average average buyer and can you talk about some of the the best sellers um, you know both like what they are and who sure. the people are behind them sure so our biggest our biggest um, product category is jewelry which was very surprising because when we started this company it was four guys and we didn't we didn't really know if we were targeting men or women in the beginning we had no idea so it was really interesting to see how quickly jewelry took off and it's still our leading category um, prints have been really, really good. A little bit of apparel, t-shirts have done well. Um, you know, what, what we're finding is that, you know, the jewelry market outside of like engagement rings is very, you know, it's a very fragmented marketplace and women are very accustomed to dealing with that fragmented marketplace. And I had no idea it was so fragmented. I mean, there's not, you know, 
most women can buy multiple pieces of jewelry from multiple vendors and not really have brand loyalty. It's more about style loyalty. That's kind of what we're saying. But yeah, to kind of, I mean, we, we thought we were gonna be a little bit more male centric and it's been exactly the opposite. Our audience is about 80, 20, 80% female. Um, can you tell us like a couple of your favorite um, designers or people people behind the products? I'm, I'm thinking of the little boy that sells the bow ties. Oh Can yeah, yeah. We, that that's the that's the other thing. That's a great question. That was a softball. That's my sister. Um, <laughs> because of the way our business model is set up, like it kind of lends itself to great content anyway. Because we're working with you know small batch makers. There's a great, I think he's like an eight or nine year old kid from Memphis, Tennessee, who makes bow ties. He like hand makes them, his name is Mo. He's apparently fairly popular. He's been on a bunch of different talk shows, but this guy is just a riot. He's, you know, about this tall and he hand sews his own bow ties and sells them at a flea market in Memphis. And now, you know, he's been on the Oprah show and all sorts of things. And he's actually built a sizable business and this great little kid. Um, but for another, I mean, just for another example, we were really surprised that we found a lot of vendors locally, that a lot of folks locally had a much broader appeal than what they have. Um, and that kind of goes, and the, and the other side of that is, we thought we were selling primarily to a Southeastern audience. We thought we were selling to, you know, from Texas to Virginia. That's who we thought our audience was gonna be and what really happened is our audience was in California, our audience was in New York, our audience was in Texas, which not surprising. Um, so that's, that's been one of the biggest learnings of this, especially when you start talking about how this business can scale, is you're actually looking at where your markets are and is there real growth opportunity. And we see that there's huge growth opportunity for this. I'm just curious about the idea itself. I mean, did, were you looking for something new to do or was it just, it just came to you? Did you brainstorm? I'm, I'm thinking about like how these magical ideas come about because this is pretty perfect. You know, it's a, it's a very focused um, branding situation, which I think is really cool, but I was just curious how it came about. So it came about, um my background is very diverse. I worked in politics for a while and then kind of got into tech um, halfway through it. And so I was, you know, when I was in politics, I was very interested in the publishing world and in media and that whole side of things. And then when I got into tech and got to work for Acumen Holdings, which is a very traditional e-commerce company, um, that's really what, what, you know, that was the, the root of the idea, was those sort of interests that I had personally. Um, but I would say this, there's no perfect idea. So when we first started this, we had tons of misconceptions of what it was going to be. But one of the things that was really important to us was to get something to market as quickly as possible so we could learn as quickly as possible. And I think a lot of times, a lot of times the media, there's a real popular media story where it's like, oh, this kid came up with this million dollar idea. And now look how successful he is. That's not really how it works, unless you're talking about like proprietary solar something, I don't know. Um, but for a consumer company, that's not really how things work. And I, I think one of the most important things I learned from the failure of my first company was that you have to, you have to get to market as quickly as possible so you can understand where you're wrong, right? And you talk to customers as soon as possible because they're the ones that are gonna dictate what your idea, if your idea even makes sense because your idea could be completely wrong. But that doesn't mean that out of that idea can't come a good business. Uh, I, while you were talking about sort of the New York, California, Texas markets being sort of a surprisingly big uh, um, audience for you, it, it reminded me, or it, it, it made me think of uh, my own experience on, on Bourbon and Boots. And, and also there's this, this store on the square up in Fayetteville, I think called Mustache. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, 
And so this is sort of an idea that you've probably already had, but I, you know, for, for cons customer acquisition is, um, you know, I'm, I'm on all the listservs for, uh, when I lived in New York and, when, uh, and now in San Francisco, I'm on the University of Arkansas listservs, even though I didn't go there, because, right. you know, it's killing me to miss the game right now, because I think when you leave the state, you know, everybody still considers Arkansas home, and it's still a big party, and you still, you have this sort of combination of nostalgia and survivor's guilt. Right. Uh, <laughs> and you, and you, so you're, uh, but maybe there's a, maybe there's a, a marketing play there where you can, like, you know, get University of North Carolina uh, um, alumni lists or U of A alumni list and and uh, uh, and you know mar market to them that 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 type of in in these in these markets like mm -hmm. California and New York and so yeah anyway. no I think I think you're exactly right I mean it's it, it's it's funny because some of the feedback we get from some of our customers is exactly like what you are you know you're an expat you left and you like. You know, you like the style and the things of home, right? And then there's kind of the flip. So there's that huge market, which is huge. And then you've got the flip side of that, which is like the hipster market in Brooklyn. And like everything I own is handmade and all organic and everything, right? So it's been really, it's been really interesting to see how that overlaps really closely with like Southern culture, right? I always like to use the, the phrase, you know, farm to table dining for me was basically just going to my grandparents house right and you know you see these you know extremely fancy farm to table restaurants and these large trends and so that was another piece of the puzzle when we were kind of thinking about this is like we see these large trends kind of converging and they all still kind of line up with this familiarity of southern culture right and so that's really you know what we've seen and what's been really interesting as we've grown Following along on that line just a little bit, uh, you know, one of the things, I'm a native Arkansan, and, and that's 66 years worth of nativity, if you want to put it that way. Uh, and and I, you know, I recall, uh, I guess it was Bush one saying that Arkansas was somewhere between Texas and Oklahoma. Uh, you know, not quite correct. I, I guess the one thing that I certainly don't have an insight is, is no, number one, what you know, is there any kind of consensus other than, of course, we referred to Central High, uh, you know, with uh, with one of our previous speakers about that kind of a millstone that hung around our neck. You know, I, I guess I'm wondering two things. One is what does the outside world, if you want to refer to that, think of Arkansas? And number two, based on that thought, is there worth some kind of marketing uh, benefit to recognize that Urban and Boots or whomever else might be an Arkansas company. Do we have anything that geographically might make people think they'd like to work through uh, us via the internet? I don't know. I'm just, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of a unique thought process. Sure. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know is a question, is, the, is really my first answer, but I do know that the opposite of that is true. Like, there are distinct reasons why people hear Bourbon and Boots Southern Lifestyle Company and immediately say, oh great, I bet they sell Confederate flag koozies, right? So we definitely have to deal with that. And that's something that we actively try to you know, push to the side. You know, we don't wanna not talk about it, but we don't want that to be the face of the company. And we get put in that, in that, uh, that hole a lot. Um, you know, as far as, as far as things being uniquely Arkansan, I mean, I don't, my initial thought is that no, there's not really something that can be initially, you know, if I'm talking to a carpenter in Asheville, North Carolina, and I'm trying to tell him that, you know, we want you to work with us because we think you have great stuff. Like, I don't think that guy's gonna say, oh, well, I wanna work with you because you're in Arkansas. It's more around the company and the brand that we create. And I mean, that's one of the things that, you know, I. Obviously, talk about Bourbon and Boots being an Arkansas company all the time because I'm also a native Arkansan and lived here most of my life, and I'm proud of that. But at the same time, I think we have to kind of get away from a parochial point of view that the internet is an online representation of everyone's offline life. So I don't think that's there's a good corollary for that. It might have been a little convoluted, but.
<laughs> Thanks, everybody. <laughs>